I feel quite privileged to be able to come to you all today from the uh, where I get to play, live, and work in the unceded territory of the Klahus First Nations, the Tala'aman First Nations, and the Homoko First Nations. So. I'm Dr. Pamela Crisco. I am one of the founding board members of the Psychedelic Association of Canada. And it's really nice to be here on this um, webinar series here sponsored by Numinous today. We've got Reed Robinson joining us today. So this is gonna be great. Um, welcome everyone. And so what we'll do here is, um, so I guess it was about a month back, maybe two months back now, we had our part one of eating disorders and psychedelics. And so what we're going to do here is Reed is going to recap some of what was covered last time to bring bring it up everyone up to speed and, and reset the stage on where we're starting at today. And then we're gonna go through a deeper dive. And following that, we'll have lots of time for Q and A. And so before I hand it over to you, Reed, I just wanna say a grand thank you to all the volunteers at the Psychedelic Association that you know really do this. There's really 1.5 paid positions for the Psychedelic Association of Canada. So our volunteers are over the top amazing. And so thank you. Thank you, Callie, who is helping out today. I'm great to have you here. Wonderful to have you back, Reed. And with that, Thanks. you introduce yourself and uh, and take it from there. How does that sound? Sounds great. Why don't I share my screen to get started? Um, and I'll present this slideshow. How does is that working? It is. Looks good. You're cool. good to all right. Um, my name is Reed Robison. I'm a psychiatrist based in Utah in the US. And I'm Chief Clinical Officer at Numinous, a Canada-based company. Uh, and we have clinics uh, in Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, and in Utah in the U.S., five of them here, and uh, one in Arizona as well. And I uh, started my career doing clinical trials in academics, got involved with ketamine pretty early in my career anyway, in 2010 was my first study. I was asked to do a study for Janssen, uh, looking at ketamine for treatment-resistant depression, IV ketamine, and then got really intrigued with not only the rapid response and non-daily pill aspect of it, but also the non-ordinary state that it would occasion. As I sat with people in these studies and what we might do with that, and as the field has emerged and... Uh, you know, the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy world in particular, I've just been, uh, you know, fascinated and fired up about uh, applying this to mental health conditions, including and especially eating disorders, which has been one of my focus areas throughout my career. I um, have been working with a treatment center out here called Center for Change uh, as their medical director for a, a number of years and have spent a lot of time there um, in past chapters of my work life, uh, full-time working with clients with eating disorders. And um, as we talked about last time, and as we'll, we'll dive into a little deeper this time, uh, eating disorders are traditionally considered uh, difficult to treat, treatment resistant, if you will, um, and lacking in available uh, medication treatment options and and it can be confusing what what therapy approaches to take um, and so um, that's uh, that's my background in a nutshell currently in our clinics we we offer uh, the whole spectrum of mental health services psychotherapy med management and then other if you will interventional approaches uh, ketamine spurbato which is S-ketamine, TMS, or transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation. And, and uh, a lot of my focus these days is on psychedelic clinical trials. We were a site for the sponsored studies like uh, USONA's uh, depression study we worked on last year. We're doing um, uh, the phase three study with Compass psilocybin for TRD. Uh, we just... Um, help complete the MindMed LSD for Anxiety study. 
uh, in uh, a couple of our Utah clinics, actually, which was uh, fascinating to sit with people through 12-hour dosing sessions. And we can talk about any of this as things progress. I encourage questions and discussion. I have, as usual for me, more slides than we'll get to. Happy to share them after. They're more of a, a guide to our discussion. So I'd be alarmed if I skip through some of them. Um, but uh, with that, why don't I... I uh, acknowledge where I'm coming from here. I live and work in Utah, which is actually named after the Ute tribe. And it's a homeland, traditional and ancestral homeland of eight distinct tribal nations. And I do this work with um, passion and, and really hoping to respect and honor and benefit the, the land and, and its history and the indigenous peoples uh, where we sit on their tradi traditional homeland. So, um, I will uh, skip over the outline that was to organize my thoughts, but um, I wanted to, I showed this uh, abstract last time, but I wanted to tell a little bit more of this story because this was, um, this was a paper uh, that uh, talks about what I think is the first ever study using psilocybin in a hospital or clinic setting back in the 1950s and Paris, France. This was um, this paper that was published specifically on the eating disorder case or cases um, was part of a bigger study of 100 individuals, mostly with mental health conditions. And uh, this case was uh, stood out to some research, some eating disorder colleagues and researchers in the space, and they wrote it up uh, a couple years ago uh, about a 35 year old lady named Henriette with anorexia nervosa. She had a BMI of less than 15, and she was admitted to the hospital um, due to starvation and was put on a psychiatric unit and placed in isolation, put on Thorazine as, as was in vogue back then, a new medication on the scene, um, sedating, old antipsychotic. And uh, about three weeks later, no improvement. Um, so while still on Thorazine, she was enrolled in this psilocybin study that... Uh, that came about uh, because of some of the like the relationship between the the docs on, in this hospital and um, Albert Hoffman and others who were figuring out how to you know synthesize these these substances that had come to light, and so they gave her eight milligrams uh, of psilocybin, a synthetic psilocybin, um, a relatively low dose, about less than a third of the dose we're using in our psilocybin studies right now for MDD, TRD, and the ones that are fast-tracked on the FDA path to potential approval. And so she gets this eight milligram dose. An hour later, she, she says, I think I'm getting better. Didn't look like she was having much of a psychedelic trip because, well, maybe because she was on Thorazine, um, an antipsychotic that, you know, is known to at least theorized, uh, hypothesized to interfere with some of the experience. Uh, and some of the, the serotonin receptors, in fact, that psilocybin works on. So she gets back to her room, but uh, even though she didn't display much, she felt euphoric, uh, felt like dancing, felt light. Uh, she later said she heard angels playing the flute, started writing poems of religious inspiration. Um, a, lot of, a lot different from her usual place of feeling disconnected from the world, um, very over-controlled and uh, shut down from a lot of life, her emotions, her spirituality. They uh, heard about her report of the experience, took her off Thorazine, and uh, four days later gave her another dose of psilocybin. And uh, this time off Thorazine, half an hour into the experience, colors changing, she feels like she's in a cloud, starts having visions, hears angels playing flutes, and even um, talked about seeing the agony of Christ and the resurrection and starts uh, reporting in this vivid detail an influx of old memories that came back like emotional traumas from childhood. The second dose um, was followed by some, some visible, noticeable, uh, pretty near immediate improvement uh, that lasted at least uh, until she discharged. So a month later, a month after the second dose, she had gained uh, 15 plus pounds, 
Um, but uh, interestingly, the improvements did not last forever. This is a low dose. This was uh, not accompanied with psychotherapy. Um, so some things that I draw from from that experience is that um, with particular application to the eating disorder world is that dose matters um, and uh, the number of dosing sessions matters. And these are things we need to figure out as a field clinically and in research. Um, and uh, the, the number of doses is likely important for lasting effects. Additionally, um, set and setting matter. And they didn't really talk about those things back then. This was just like a new medicine that there wasn't uh, you know, a cultural phenomenon around yet. And uh, they just gave the medicine to people, shuttled them around to different rooms in the hospital, subjecting them to different psychological tests. Many reported feeling annoyed, poked, prodded psychologically. Um, and so, some reported it was kind of a um, dysphoric experience. And, and so the last thing I kind of draw from this is that the therapy paired with these, um, especially in eating disorders, it appears to be quite important. And uh, these medicines, as, we talk, as we'll talk about, um, can be viewed, especially in this type of treatment, as opening up a therapeutic window to do some deep work. And that's what I want to focus on um, somewhat today. So let's uh, let get back to my slides. A little bit of recap, uh, about 10% of people will experience a, an eating disorder in their lifetime. And uh, yet these are um, extremely under-recognized, underfunded, under-treated, and uh, largely misunderstood even in, the, even in the healthcare community. And, you know, if you it's one of the areas of mental health where, um, you know, therapists will also say, "Oh, I don't, I don't do that kind of work." It's really a, a specialized area with specialized kinds of therapy, and and that's part of the reason why uh, why we'll explore some of these conditions and their treatments in more depth, um, and also because the. Uh, my my view is that uh, psychedelics represent a tool in the toolkit and and will need to be paired with integrated, if you will, with traditional treatments for this to be, you know, helpful and and if we if we want a chance at lasting change. Um, and so a recap of the different conditions I've drawn, like a, a Venn diagram that is not to scale here, just to represent some rough uh, prevalence um, numbers. Um, that we won't uh, focus much on, but just to, to recap, restricting conditions are where you limit food intake and, and with anorexia in particular, you have an inability by definition of the disorder to maintain a minimally healthy weight. And uh, binging or binge eating episodes it, it consists of rapid, rapidly consuming a large amount of food for for that individual uh, with a loss of control during and feelings of discomfort, shame, et cetera, after. And binge eating disorder is one of the newer conditions, especially among the, the more prevalent ones. Um, and in fact is, um, you know, by most people's uh, assessment, the most prevalent eating disorder. And uh, binging plus purging. So per represents uh, bulimia and there are other conditions with with purging as part of it, but purging is basically anything that eliminates the calories that you've consumed. This could be vomiting, but it doesn't have to be. It could be excessive use of laxatives or diuretics, and it could be ex uh, ex excessive exercise. Um, I have a, a textbook on my desk, an old one called Activity Anorexia, um, and some used to call this kind of like a frenetic foraging, which I find an interesting term, but but uh, anorexia um, often co-occurs with, with OCD and uh, is uh, certainly an, an over-control type of condition. And, and the, the binging and purging, bulimia has features of, of both the loss of control and, and over-control. Um, but that, that loss of control is really a, a distinguishing factor between that and anorexia and, and binge eating. This is also loss of control like an addictive uh, disorder pattern would be. Um, and so 
all that being said, uh, there was, um, I wanted to point this study out because it was done in Canada. Uh, 1,500 women were surveyed. I think they had this automated dialer calling homes and asking, you know, if you meet this criteria, are you a, a female willing to answer these questions? I, and I believe they used the, what's called the EDEQ, a self-report, um, very well validated um, eating disorder questionnaire. And, and, and of the mean age of these women was 31, about 15% fell into what would be considered a sub-threshold uh, disordered eating category. Um, about 5% had frequent binge eating, 10% had either purging or some frequent compensation, a looser definition of, of purging, but like exercising hard or restricting hard to influence your size, shape, weight. And uh, at least 10% had excessive fear of weight gain, fear of weight gain being exceedingly more common. And if you look at numbers of, uh, of, of young women, uh, adolescent females, and uh, and males, um, the numbers are striking and and worsening. In fact, uh, the the rate of body image distress, um, disordered eating thoughts and behaviors is uh, alarmingly high and increasing, especially since COVID, in uh, young people. Uh, but before we talk about that and social media and some things, I wanted to point out this this study that. I find really interesting. It's one that could not, would not be repeated these days. It was in the day, the days before the uh, the IRB and ethics boards um, and the the ethical codes of conduct and research that exist today. But um, there was a, a researcher, Ansel Keys, at the University of Minnesota in the U.S., who recruited. Uh, 30 something conscientious war objectors who volunteered. Yeah, I, I won't go to war and I'll do your study if you don't get me in trouble. Um, and they agreed to be starved essentially um, using a, a, by being given a 1500 K cal per day diet um, of mostly starchy things, bread, turnips, potatoes. And they were on this regimen of walking uh, 22 miles a day. And um, so one of the participants, as things progressed, as they, um, as they lost more and more weight, their obsession with size, shape, food increased in uh, many people. There was also a decline in energy. One of the participants, when walking home on this mandatory long walk, um, just couldn't stop thinking about like soda, for example, and, and would go into soda shops and just look. Um, and uh, there are some interesting things like evolutionarily that happen, like when we have clients uh, admitted to an eating disorder treatment area, sometimes there's food stashed away in their suitcase that they would not eat, but uh, there's this hardwired kind of survival um, starvation mechanism that that uh, you know, I believe is fueling some of that focus or obsession on on food and and having food available, uh, even if the the mind and the restriction and the over control um, can keep the consumption of those things at bay. Um, and then, uh, you know, what what was learned from this uh, this study was that uh, even after weight was restored, the the mental and physical consequences uh, remained much longer than that. And uh, as we see in eating disorders these days, like when someone is weight restored, um, the brain is tends to be the last thing to uh, really return to baseline in terms of its uh, cognitive flexibility and, and other things. So um, I do believe and have seen that uh, full recovery is possible, but it does take time. And that's an important thing to, to keep in mind in doing this work and designing studies and protocols. Um, so I won't, uh, I won't um, go into this too much, but uh, suffice it to say that the, there is a genetic component that doesn't look that different from many uh, other mental health conditions. Um, you know, there's a range of 20 something to 80 something percent uh, heritability of mental health conditions. You have autism spectrum disorders on the higher end and some of the more common, uh, uh, highly prevalent ones, multifactorial are on the 
lower end, but even in the like the traumas and things that there are, um, there is this phenomenon of uh, what you might call in oncology or other things of two hit um, hypothesis or, or where genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Um, individuals with eating disorders seem to have a predisposition to certain traits. And there's a paper I believe was by uh, Walter Kay and colleagues out of UCSD called like when good traits go bad. So individuals with eating disorders um, are often highly uh, intelligent, capable, um, motivated individuals. And that, uh, that drive and persistence in a perfect storm of genetic plus environmental factors can lead to the development of, uh, you know, an episode of disordered eating behaviors. And these behavior patterns can become quite sticky and resistant to treatment. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that eating disorders rarely occur in isolation. Um, you know, over 50%, um, and this is a hard number to pinpoint, have, have uh, a significant uh, history of childhood trauma, such as sexual abuse. It's different by depending on which condition you're looking at. And uh, depression, highly prevalent anxiety. If you look at some conditions, like I mentioned, anorexia co-occurs a lot with OCD, both being over-controlled conditions and bulimia, for example, binge eating to a lesser extent would have a, a higher rates of substance use disorders and other conditions. Um, and we'll look at kind of um, a bird's eye view in a bit of what that looks like. But um, Tara Brock is, is a psychotherapist and Buddhist meditation teacher. But I think her quote here, when I stumbled upon it once, uh, really made me think of uh, the eating disorder uh, situation. She says that perhaps the biggest tragedy of our lives is that freedom is possible, yet we can pass our years trapped in the same old patterns. We want to love others without holding back, feel authentic, breathe in the beauty around us, dancing, eat, etc. Yet each day we listen to inner voices that keep our life small. Um, and uh, we could apply that, of course, to a lot of a lot of things in life. Um, and one thing that really uh, has always drawn me to and intrigued me about eating disorder research and clinical work is that we all have a relationship with food and body. Um, and, and if you look at it, um, I rarely find individuals who would even report that their relationship with, with their body and food is um, perfectly balanced and flexible and and uh, resilient and like if if someone says that it is um, it's an interesting thought experiment to say what would it be like if you gained or lost 20 pounds like how would you feel about your body image then and many people haven't you know whether they have or have not gone through something like that it does bring up like like many other, things in life, triggers that we have yet to experience, kind of like when you get in relationship and push all these buttons you didn't know you had. Um, you know, I, I see it in a similar way with uh, our relationship with food and body. And if you want to look at this from a spiritual perspective, um, there's a book that's uh, by a gal named Jean and Roth called uh, Women, God and Food. And that uh, is just a fascinating perspective, but I'll just share one idea from that book is that your relation, and she says that your relationship with food is your relationship with God, or your relationship with food is your relationship with everything. Um, uh, it, it's similar to that idea that how we do one thing is how we do everything, um, or that eating disorder symptoms are a window. It's to what's uh, what's going on in our soul. Um, and uh, so on, along those lines, um, food, we all we all uh, have this relationship with food and an interest in health, healthy eating can become uh, dangerous when it um, masks other worries um, that can't be solved by food or when it crowds out the good stuff or shuts us off from life. And, uh, 
you know, nutrition um, being talked about so much in uh, in healthcare, all aspects of it. Um, yet um, there's this other side of that coin when uh, when good traits can go bad, or when dieting behaviors, especially in people at risk, can um, put people into uh, very dangerous territory. Um, so you know, on the one hand, there's this this positive relationship with food where food may be a, a great source of joy for you, uh, sharing a meal with people, connecting. Um, it may fuel your, your um, physical exploration and embodiment in the world. Um, and, and on the other side, that more pathological maladaptive side, it closes you off. Um, you, you might be seeking health, but finding something that is very um, counterproductive uh, deteriorate, deteriorating your health, impairing your functioning. Um, and uh, you see this um, unfold uh, where the individual is often unaware. They're either told by a friend or a healthcare provider or um, the media that they should eliminate this and then they do. And then they uh, eliminate another thing and another thing, and another thing. And the the uh, flexibility out there with their eating becomes uh, more and more limited over time. And just like um, when body image distress mounts, it can really not only cause what, what we call in the field body checking, like always looking, looking in mirrors, looking and seeing yourself through a, a distorted lens, but it can prevent you from doing many of the things that you would find joying in life, like going swimming or or going uh, out uh, and connecting with other humans, et cetera. Um, so that uh, being said, a word on social media. Um, social media, I mean, this research has been going on pre-social media back in the, the beauty magazine days. Like just flipping through a beauty magazine for 15 minutes was enough to like, to have someone spiral into a, uh, negative body image um, state with uh, ruminating on that. And so in, in samples of, of young women, for example, social media was has been found time and time again to impact weight and shape concerns and be correlated with eating disorder symptoms. Um, one week of exposure in one study to pro-eating disorder website content uh, led to like a 20% reduction in caloric intake in these participants. Um, in a control group that was uh, exposed to other content that may have just been more neutral health and fitness. Um, and so uh, general internet use even is associated with uh, body image and eating concerns. And uh, men and women are both, uh, both impacted. Interestingly, um, social media has more of a, a link to anorexia and bulimia uh, video gaming, which I guess you could intuitively see um, is associated with more of a risk of binge eating episodes and and uh, video gaming itself can be a pattern that people feel out of control and similar to binge eating episodes. So um, uh, a word on screening, I may have mentioned this last time, but um, I talked about the EDEQ uh, that was done in that Canada study. There's something out of the UK called the SCOF, um, probably one of the older and more validated questionnaires. Very simple. If you can uh, remember to translate question number, uh, what was it? Uh, question number three in the original scale says, have you recently lost more than like one stone, they call it in three months. I, um, I, I forget, but there's uh, this, the stone is a term for a certain number of kilograms out there. And, uh, but these questions are highly sensitive, relatively um, good on the specificity front um, in picking them up. And, and I, I highlight this again, just because we need more and more. Screening and early detection, uh, early intervention is so key because these patterns do become more and more ingrained. Um, and uh, so if you look at uh, eating disorders and related conditions, um, you can, I find it useful sometimes to plot the difference between, uh, you know, a, a famine induced situation. Um, 
and uh, weight loss from a physical illness with anorexia, for example. But uh, I'll just point out a couple things here as we forge ahead. Um, anorexia nervosa, there can be restricting type or binge purge type. Um, and in and they both, by definition of being anorexia nervosa, have the uh, the low body weight, um, where bulimia um, has more of a normal um, or not low body weight. And there are some uh, some conditions like ARFID, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, that are uh, that is uh, associated with autism spectrum disorders in many people, not all, and. Uh, and then other conditions like OCD, even the absence of full-blown anorexia, obviously, as, as we know, can have kind of an obsession and compulsion with certain aspects of food. Um, so a little bit on, uh, a little bit more on some of these conditions, and we'll talk about how they're treated traditionally and, and the role of, the potential role of psychedelics. And so anorexia um, used to be, defined differently, but now it uses more BMI cutoffs for the severity, about 1% of women in their lifetime, a little higher on the heritability front. About a third have a comorbid mood disorder, like full-blown. Uh, more than that, have an anxiety disorder. And there, there is, uh, besides the, the psychiatric comorbidities, there are a lot of medical um, consequences of this illness. And as we hear a lot, um, in mental health and in the psychedelic field that has been thankfully paying attention to anorexia. Anorexia has the highest mortality rate of any mental health condition, and yet it has zero FDA approved treatment options. Um, there are off-label things that we'll talk about, um, but as the body um, becomes more and more undernourished, the heart rate slows down and preservation mode, loss of bone density, which people are largely unaware of, and can have some some big consequences as 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 we age in life. Um, hair loss uh, and some skin changes are ways that it can be picked up. Similar to how bulimia can be detected by dentists and some of the erosion of teeth from purging, for example. Um, but uh, anorexia comes with this intense fear of gaining weight. Um, and when someone enters treatment, like a treatment center in twenty four hour care, uh, the the mainstay of treatment is weight restoration. Here you have someone with uh, co-occurring anxiety, maybe even OCD, if not you know OCD full blown or or commonly traits of it. Um, you can imagine how difficult that would be to be in that other environment and be required to eat to survive. Um, required being uh, one of the big debates in the field, like what does involuntary treatment look like in, in anorexia? When does someone have the capacity to decide to starve themselves into what degree? Um, and we could discuss some of that afterwards if it's relevant and of interest, um, but the body dysmorphia and anorexia can be, can be strikingly um, uh, distorted. Um, in fact, there are these studies, and we see, see this in clinical groups too, where if you have someone in like a group therapy session, you have individuals with anorexia do either a body tracing, like draw draw what they think their body looks like on a giant piece of paper, then lay down on it and see how that compares or take a belt and tighten it to the, um, the circumference you think your waist is and then hold it around you. Um, Interestingly, um, those things are way off um, for the individual themselves, but when they're looking at at you as their clinician, um, they don't have that same uh, dysmorphia applied to your body or or others. It's really a self consideration. Um, and uh, bulimia. Talk about uh, how it's kind of diagnosed and categorized. Um, bulimia is not um, defined as an inability to maintain healthy body weight. If someone is purging. Um, and uh, restricting and has a, has a very low body weight, that would be anorexia binge purge type. Um, but bulimia has recurrent kind of binge episodes and then compensatory behaviors, purging, 
at least once a week, at least for three months, because the rate of purging um, for a time or, or in less frequency is pretty high as, especially in certain populations, like as uh, adolescent females, for example, um, and those participating in certain activities that body that are focused on body, like sports, ballet, um, and uh, related to their social media use as well. Um, we talked about some of the other ways people purge, but the medical consequences of bulimia um, can have more of an irregular heart rate. We check people's potassium when they come in and and get really uh, proactive about monitoring and and uh, restoring that when needed. Um, uh, tooth decay, I mentioned, uh, inflammation of the esophagus, ulcers, et cetera, um, and high rates of mood disorder, a bit higher prevalence than anorexia. Now, about 50% are, are only purging by vomiting, um, a lesser amount, say vomiting laxatives, um, and then uh, and then bulimia without purging is, is less common, but certainly exists. And, and sometimes the laxative use can uh, escalate to alarming levels that are hard to imagine, but I've seen clients come in who are taking dozens and dozens of laxatives a day, some who have got up to 200 and some who are just so close to the, uh, so close to uh, the toilet all day because of the amount of laxatives, as you can imagine, um, is is extremely disruptive to not only their physical health but their their life functioning. Um, and so, binge eating disorder is. Uh, uh, I mentioned uh, what a binge episode is is like. That uh, you know, there's often a trigger, um, but it, there might not be. There's there are some types of binge eating episode that uh, disorders that show up when people take. Ambient, like night eating syndrome, and they're disinhibited, more on an autopilot, and they end up binging. Um, but this uh, this shows up in a pretty high percentage um, compared to other eating disorders. Maybe three, four percent of of adults in North America would meet criteria, and the criteria being, um, you know, full blown binge episodes uh, with that loss of control eating a large amount in a relatively short period of time. These can go on for a while too. And then followed by those, the guilt and shame after. And um, to meet criteria, it has to be once a week for, for three months, similar to bulimia. Um, and binge eating disorder does uh, show up, um, you know, co-occur more with uh, say type two diabetes. Um, interestingly at our center here in Utah, there's a special expertise in what's called diabulimia or the, the um, inappropriate use of insulin to uh, manage your weight and, and as kind of a way you could view as, as purging. And that can be, uh, of course, quite dangerous um, with blood sugar on the line. Um, and so I'll skip over the DSM criteria because you can look at those, but um, I think we talked about last time that uh, prevalence um, and some markers of severity of eating disorders are, have been increasing in recent years and, and COVID really magnified this. Um, like uh, um, a big uptake in admissions, calls to crisis and helplines focused on these kind of things and uh, um, really a, a great kind of shake up or magnifier of some of the, some of the symptoms that were uh, maybe under undetected underneath the surface, um, and uh, a little bit on the the neurobiology of of food and eating disorders um, to help guide our discussion. Um, so normally, when you're hungry, um, dopamine is the molecule of more and motivates us towards towards something. Um, so it's it's more rewarding when we're when we're hungry compared to when we're full. And so when restrictive eating follows a binge, the binge becomes even more rewarding and post binge guilt leads to further restriction, reinforcing this cycle. So dopamine's already um, the great kind of reinforcer of patterns. Um, and so in bulimia, the reward pathways are, are you know, in some studies more active um, 
than controls when viewing food, recurrent purging, um, also has an impact on acetylcholine. We'll talk about a little bit um, where the high levels are signaling something unpleasant. Um, and then, oop, okay, I just did something with my screen here, but um, so in anorexia, over time, you get this decreased sensitivity to that feeling of reward with dopamine. Uh, and then related to um, this restrictive eating behavior pattern, there's uh, like a lot of fear and a sense of punishment around food. And um, there's a lot of an emphasis on uh, the, the long-term weight loss, keeping that at bay and uh, decreased cognitive flexibility as the brain gets more and more malnourished. That is hard to um, get out of. It's this um, kind of cognitive phenomenon that some would call set shifting or cognitive flexibility is an early thing to show up in malnutrition and one of the, the last things to go away, an ability to see the forest from the trees and the face of food, even if you may have said um, time and time again, all day leading up to that moment that you want to eat, you want to get back on track with your goals when faced with that food, all systems on board saying in kind of a fight or flight way, do not eat that. Um, it becomes kind of a, a life or death type of situation in their, in their system. Um, and culture, of course, has really um, not been helpful uh, in so many ways on um, how we view food and, and body. So um, let's uh, forge ahead here. Um, so this is kind of a, a bird's eye view of what's what's going on. You have these these uh, pre existing traits, if you will, like anxious or obsessional ones, risk factors. You know, it'd be very rule rule oriented, uh, risk averse, um, like emotionally. Uh, self-regulated, over-regulated, if you will. Um, and then in the face of kind of stress or other situations, say a move, an early puberty, uh, participating in one of these activities, uh, a family, a relationship change or trauma, um, you got these, these factors and this perfect storm leading to using food to try and control what one can, what, fe what one feels like one can. So eating disorders very quickly uh, beyond that are not a conscious choice. Um, well, one might make a decision to engage in a restrictive, like a, a diet or restricting what one eats um, for a brief time, you know, these do quickly become kind of subconscious and uh, ingrained. And uh, as we've been talking about, um, the cycle kind of continues and deepens. Um, so dopamine, exists, you know, I, the way I see it is to propagate the species. Like it, it points us towards the things like food and, um, and sex that, uh, lead to survival of us and our, and our family, our species, the highly rewarding, reinforcing the mechanism, all, uh, fine and good in, um, in days when you need to get out there and forage and, and cook connect with your your tribe or another human to reproduce and all that but but these days um with uh with the way food exists in our culture the way media uh, portrays bodies and things like that it's a whole different ball game full of these landmines and different considerations than they had as these things started to evolve um so let's uh Let's see, I'm gonna skip over some of this stuff so we can get into the psychedelic discussion and leave plenty of time for questions, but happy to share the slides if anyone would like to, like to look. But one thing I'll mention from a, a paper on eating disorders, neurotransmitters and acetylcholine is that this regulation of habit formation is key to eating disorder treatment and recovery. So while this wasn't from a, you know, a psychedelic paper, it might get the wheels turning of of why these things might be useful. Um, and uh, so let's talk about how eating, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but how 
eating disorders were treated traditionally, starting with uh, medication management and just the, the treatment setting. So, um, you know, mild or sub-threshold eating disorders, disordered e eating behavior patterns can, are often first treated outpatient. And then at a higher level of care, there's intensive outpatient might be in there a couple hours, a few times a week. Day treatment is looking like you know, six hours a day, five to seven days a week. Residential care, you're in there in 24-hour care, sleeping there, groups and, and visits and unit programming. You might be there for a month or two. Inpatient is uh, where with the highest level of care um, for those who need, especially medical stabilization, feeding to et cetera. Um, as I mentioned, no FDA approved meds for anorexia. Bulimia has Prozac and binge eating disorder has Vyvanse. Um, we are, there There has been a very early uh, preliminary small study of psilocybin for binge eating disorder that I'll talk about. Um, and uh, we're doing some other studies with uh, binge eating disorder coming up soon out of our research clinic. Um, sponsored ones, not of our design, but uh, one psychedelic, one not. Um, and uh, as I kind of alluded to, the whole idea of like involuntary treatment is, is a big debate and very state dependent in the US. I'm not as familiar with how that's um, being done in, uh, in Canada, but there's also a debate around uh, around palliative care and uh, how much to push this. Um, and some of the other more uh, invasive things like deep brain stimulation that it has been used, studied for OCD, for example. Um, eating disorders are best approached with the multidisciplinary treatment team. There's often a, like a, a physician or, or psychiatrist um, as a, you know, a, a key part of that and a, and a psychotherapist, dietitian. Um, there's a typo in that dietitian here, but uh, it is it is a teamwork approach that I quite uh, enjoy and was uh, really, really uh, a fun part of, of working with this, a collaborative one of, you know, working with um, all the different specialties and focusing on all these aspects of one's life, um, but, but also a needed part because of, um, you know, it's not just a psychiatrist you need on board. You need like a, um, a primary care or internal medicine specialist, to, you know, ideally with uh, knowledge and comfort around um, doing the frequent EKGs and labs and monitoring for the medical con considerations. But but uh, all this to just say there's a we need to have a sense of, of urgency um, around detecting and intervening on these. Um, and uh and this is how I'd summarize uh, what treatment looks like is uh, the, the main pillar is uh, for restrictive eating conditions like anorexia would be weight restoration. But even for like uh, bulimia, binge eating disorder, um, especially when outpatient interventions have failed, um, the approach is to get someone out of that environment and into a structured environment where they can be supported um, as the triggers come up and the urge to engage in a binge or purge cycle um, is uh, more than the individual could bear on their own. And then you have the environment and the, the team where you just don't have the ability to do it. And you can imagine how uncomfortable that can feel for the individual. So, um, and then the other thing is uh, to try and avoid the revolving door phenomenon that has seen in eating disorder treatment of people uh, getting weight restored, for example, going back out in the world with the same kind of unhealed um, old wounds and traumas or, um, you know, traits and, and other things really uh, at risk for, uh, for showing up again in a big way and the right stressors, um, people can bounce back over and over to treatment and, and the overall course can, can decline. Because, um, uh, I, I like this idea that it's not just about the food. The food is um, like the substance, um, you know, what one is using in response to the underlying pain. And, uh, you know, I believe in the importance of 
kind of uncovering those things underneath the surface and using the symptoms and the behaviors as a, a window to the struggling soul, if you will. Um, and then uh, just a, a reminder that reshaping these patterns does take time. And sometimes it takes a, a radical change in one's environment, structure, life, um, a, a radical disruption in patterns. Um, and so the way psychotropics are approached, especially in conditions where it's there's nothing approved, so it's all off label. You know, I believe should be just carefully considered as tools and toolkit for temporary use to help someone accomplish those aims to get um, to get back on track with um, weight restoration. For example, we know from the uh, kind of the um, literature that's been around for a while and and is growing that. Antidepressants, for example, um, don't work as well when someone is extremely malnourished. You know, maybe the building blocks and and uh, kind of receptor activity and things like that are are not as uh, are not as um, prone to be treated when one is starved. And I had I wondered about how this would play out with when I started working with ketamine with with eating disorders, but there's no real evidence to say that. That applies. Just some mixed opinions and theories, but but uh, I think everyone agrees on the fact that uh, weight restoration is is a, a key part, at least to um, a certain degree, in the treatment process for undernourished conditions. And it's hard to do much when you're in that starved state, as we saw in the uh, the Minnesota starvation experiment. Experiment. Not to say that psychedelics. Um, wouldn't be a tool on that path at potentially early stages, but but in in you know just based on the data from from uh, psychotropics in general, um, you know weight restoration is uh, is where the focus should be, and and any other things that we can we can test and show uh, might help facilitate that path. Great, and just like we might use. Um, temporary um, as needed anti-anxiety treatments for someone's full-blown panic as they face eating food um, or you know trying to keep that feeding tube in and running for example um, and then there's this overall um, feeling in the field like exists in mental health more broadly but per perhaps even more in eating disorders that that psychotherapy is key and uh, and medications uh are always better when paired with psychotherapy and, and especially with eating disorders. And there are some special considerations like, well, Butrin has a black box warning for eating disorders. It doesn't specify, but the data comes from bulimia and well, Butrin increasing the seizure threshold. It's a highly, it's a dose dependent thing. Like the seizure threat, the seizure risk of taking 150 milligrams of well, Butrin is quite different than um, taking 450 milligrams where the, se the seizure threshold just lowers and lowers. Um, but uh, stimulants also are this double-edged sword because ADHD, um, untreated, significant, uh, clear-cut ADHD can make certain eating disorders hard to treat, but appetite suppressing, uh, these things can also be abused and fuel people's restriction. Um, so... Um, I think I'll, uh, we can circle back to this in any questions, but let's get to some psychedelic uh, content. Um, first of all, just uh, focusing on how therapy works. I, I skipped over the alphabet soup of psychotherapies because that's kind of, um, th there have been a number explored over decades in in eating disorders, like family-based therapy for, for teens. There's, you know, emotion-focused therapy, emotion-focused family therapy. There's DBT, radically open DBT, focused on over-control conditions. They're really um, intense and I find quite, you know, smart and useful for many protocol that uh, takes a big commitment to stick to. But if we focus more on the process rather than the the therapy title or, or the specific method. Um, I like to look at uh, what are we doing in therapy? Um, we're, we're looking for these, these entrenched 
maladaptive patterns. So maladaptive meaning uh, patterns of behaviors or ways we show up in the world that get us in trouble, maladaptive. And, and these become sticky or more and more entrenched. And as these entrenched patterns are more likely to recur. And, and so why then does um, pop therapy help? And I'm speaking more in general um, before even focusing too much on eating disorders, but um, so where do these, these entrenched maladaptive patterns come from? Uh, there's this saying I, I like that if it's hysterical, like if you're triggered and your reaction is bigger out of proportion to the situation, which we all do sometimes, we see all the time, think of someone's road rage, think of someone's like coming unhinged. Um, if it's hysterical, um, it's historical, very likely, like uh, could likely be traced to some past experience of feeling that way that has been unhealed or, or has turned into a mechanism of vulnerability where that button pushed. So, um, you know, there's also this, this idea I like of, uh, you know, bring on the triggers or the, the, these triggers are, are friends to follow, or they show you where the work lies. The obstacle is the path. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of maladaptive patterns, these could be just formative experiences, not just traumas, but like, uh, as you're growing up as a kid, uh, when you fell off your bike, did a parent say, oh, no, don't cry. Here's an ice cream cone. Or how was food approached at the dinner table growing up? Um, how much dieting and diet culture was in your home and your friend group? Um, and, uh, you know, this was uh, a lot more prevalent and less uh, known to be concerning in past generations, even though diet culture uh, abounds in really um, striking and and um, harmful ways, in my opinion. But um, and kids, you know, kids are more um, prone, to, of course, to getting shaped um, and rely on the adults to provide them guidance and um, and and they don't. Uh, yeah, so they're more prone to uh, kind of self self blame or. Um, take things on in a way that sticks and turns into these um, mechanisms of vulnerability that can be triggered and can turn into these patterns. So um, then how then does uh, therapy help change someone? Um, so looking at a few mechanisms, one uh, you might call extinction, like have lobbying conditioning, you're a, a combat veteran, PTSD, hear a loud noise, you startle. If you reactivate that startle in a safe supported place um then you know your cortex uh you know will initially respond in the same way but you start to you start to in that environment uh realize and integrate that the that the threat isn't there anymore and this this can take time you know it can take a lot of repetition and this kind of extinction is not necessarily permanent, but always kind of um, shaping us in one direction or another. Um, and so then uh, mechanism, and I have a couple typos here, this should say mechanism two, but uh, you might call a uh, critical period of neuroplasticity for memory reconsolidation. Like uh, if you look at Gould Dolan's work, um, especially recently on psychedelics and the opening up that critical period. I think this is um, this is uh, why that might be so helpful in um, treating mental health conditions and other things with psychedelics, because when the original pattern um, is activated or in this state, um, there's there's when there's a prediction error out there in the world, um, there's a chance to reshape the hierarchy inside of us of how we automatically respond, especially if we shine a light of awareness on it and are working on that, the activation of the pattern needs to be kind of significant, significant enough to create the uh, conditions for change, but then it can be a more lasting mechanism of change. And um, another, another part of this is like cognitive dissonance, you know, that inconsistency among belief and behaviors that becomes um, 
uh, that we become aware of can create this psychological tension. And uh, the brain then takes some steps to try and resolve that dissonance or restore harmony, or it can when you're working on these things actively. So um, mechanism number three that I'll point out, and, and there would be a lot of ways to define this, a lot of different mechanisms to to call these, but these are, I think, three main ones or three of my favorite ones. And back in the 40s, uh, Alexander French and colleagues coined this term corrective experience or corrective emotional experience. Like when uh, a client comes in to uh, therapy or a relationship expecting to get rejected by sharing their shameful truth, I think they're going to get, um, you know, broken up with or thrown out of the therapy room. But then if that does not happen, the person just sits there and accepts them uh, with love and compassion, prediction error, and a golden opportunity for, for clearing that old pattern or reconsolidating that memory. Um, and so this, this becomes uh, highly useful and relevant in the psychedelic therapy world because um, if you view all of your interactions with a client from, you know, from the very beginning, um, screening and evaluation and prep uh, to the dosing room and the integration work, um, this, uh, these new experiences can really um, be corrective in these old patterns, especially the, inter the interpersonal ones or the relational ones to disconfirm ones self-limiting belief, path pathological beliefs, and, and uh, there's also that interpersonal soothing component of it all. Um, so those three mechanisms are what I wanted to highlight. A few other thoughts, uh, you know, most of our mental activity, what is it, 80,000 thoughts a day or something going on beneath the surface of our conscious awareness, and, and it is tricky without engaging the body in this work as we see in trauma work and somatic therapies to navigate the labyrinth of the mind um, especially with the mind that got stuck in the first place um, and so if you look at approaches like Hakomi therapy that uh, you know I'm a fan of and I think pairs well like many things do with psychedelics but in a state of uh, like mindful compassion. And if you give these gentle ways of uh, like bringing up memories or guiding someone to go to this activated place that those old patterns can start to heat up, come to the surface and you have something to work with. Take a psychedelic, things come to the surface. You have something to work with. Um, and, uh, and then another thought is just that these core values that we tend to really deeply internalize um, are ch more challenging or take more time to uh, to shape and change in therapy because they, they you know they may start in the cortex but end up kind of stuck in the limbic system and emotionally tied if you will um, and uh, so that's uh, that's another challenge to be aware of you know and, and just to sum sum up one of the, I, I see one of the big aims of therapy is, um, not just to correct things in the relationship with corrective experiences, but to help the, the client learn how to start doing that in their inner dialogue, in, the, in their own inner world um, outside of the therapy room. So uh, let's talk about psychedelics and eating disorders and uh, hopefully soon get into some, some questions, discussion. But um, if you were to take time out of the equation, like if depression, some might oversimplify, regret about the past or stuck in the past, anxiety, worrying about the future, take time out of all that. Um, and uh, things tend to get a little more similar. Like if you plot conditions on this spectrum of, of loss of control on the entropy chaos side and, and over control on the other side, so say psychosis being a loss of touch with reality. Um, you know, you're having nightmares or binge eating pattern, substance use, depression cannot um, get out of bed or, or put one foot in front of the other in some ways, like an, uh, a loss of control or, or entropic state. And then the over control, 
you know, excessively worrying and trying to control for that obsessions, compulsions, anorexia, restrictive eating um, would be on that uh, rigidity part of the spectrum. And I bring this up because, um, well, one other kind of background concept to re revisit is um, this entropic brain theory. There's a great paper by Carl Harris and colleagues called that. Um, and the free energy principle that it's based on is, is um, takes this stance or assumption that you know, we're wired in our systems to uh, reduce uncertainty um, because that's uncomfortable and potentially threatening. Um, so the brain's always updating this hierarchy of, of mental models, predicting what's gonna happen based on our priors, if you will, or the prior beliefs. And, and these are layered on each other in a hierarchy and take in the sensory input, like what happens, touch something that hurt, file it away, don't touch that. Um, touch something, it didn't hurt. Oh, there's a chance to refile, reconfigure um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and uh, the higher level levels of this hierarchy send the predictions down. The lower levels take the sensory input in. When they don't match, you have two choices. Do you update your prior beliefs, your you're filing a way of, of what you think is going to happen and how you're going to behave, or you can just ignore it and keep your old priors. This is done beneath the surface in, for the most part. And, um, and in eating disorders, depending on which one, like anorexia would be a, an example of ignoring the sensory inputs and, and maintaining, giving excessive weight to the patterns that might restrict. Um, and why is this relevant? Because of uh, the other part of that entropic brain theory, uh, rebus or relaxed beliefs under psychedelics that, um, that is this idea that psychedelics will reduce the, the weight of these tightly held priors, these rules restrictions. Um, uh, a metaphor might be that they heat up the structures so they can be shaped or more plastic. Um, so they can bend and not break. Um, and as the brain cools, that neuroplasticity window um, winds down, the hierarchy reforms, and hopefully in a consciously reconfigured way that's adaptive and not maladaptive. In theory, you could reshape your patterns in a negative way, right? As we can kind of imagine from using psychedelics unwisely or, or um, things like that. So, that's that's why then do psychedelics show show promise for both ends of the spectrum? It's it's a really interesting question, but but on the the rigidity front, the over control, they can relax the strength of the top down prior beliefs. Like I can't eat that because it will make me gain too much weight. They give more emphasis to the sensory inputs, like ooh mindfulness eating, am I full? Do I enjoy this? Should I keep going? That, that state of awareness that gives you the choice based on sensory input, um, they can, um, in this theory, help with that. So um, let's uh, switch gears and talk for a sec about the mystical experience, uh, the mystical experience and uh, how that plays in all this. But um, you're probably well aware of this really interesting experiment uh, in Boston back in the 60s. Walter Penke, Dick Alpert, aka Ram Das, uh, Tim Leary uh, were involved in this study where they gave 30 milligram psilocybin to 20 Harvard Divinity students who went into this, this uh, Marsh Chapel, kind of basement chapel in the Divinity School. And uh, they received this lecture from a, you know, a well-known eloquent uh, pastor, the sermon, and there was a choir. And uh, this was, this was a placebo controlled study, which when Rick Doblin did his like uh, graduate thesis and he published this, um, he uh, found that uh, nine out of 10 who received psilocybin reported a genuine mystical experience, one of the high points of their spiritual life. What I find really interesting is Nine out of 10 of those who got psilocybin went on to become ministers, pastors in the profession they sought out um, versus zero out of 10. I know it's a small study, can't conclude a whole lot, but it just fascinated to me uh, how it deepened their 
spirituality and the path of pursuit in that without kind of people ask, oh, we're running out of time. I uh, I am going to wind down momentarily, move into questions. Do we have until, I was told we have until, until 6.30. What is our, I mean, 6.30, so 5.30 BC time. When do we need to wind down, by the way, maybe? Someone it, can it's, refresh. It's Five twelve BC time. So we're okay. Eighteen okay, we're minutes getting... finished. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the thanks for the reminder. So we measure the mystical experience and now the uh, like the challenging experience or emotional breakthrough and can see that higher scores um, on the mystical experience, especially when combined with an emotional breakthrough or a challenging experience, can lead to more lasting change. Um, so when there's that non-ordinary state taking us outside of our our day-to-day -day waking consciousness, our ego, and um, you do some kind of emotional workout or face something difficult, get some confidence of getting the other side, that's where the magic lies. Um, and so, so all, all that to uh, lead to this little summary of why might psychedelics be helpful for these conditions is um, creating, um, well, alleviating some of the symptoms by the, the cognitive flexibility, that rigidity we're talking about, um, the bringing all systems on board, back in your body, um, reconnected with emotions, going to those memories that, that were pushed away, and then inducing this brain state that might um, accelerate the therapy or make it easier to receive, especially in eating disorders. So um, with that, uh, why don't I just uh, wind down there with slides and open it up to chat about questions. Great, Reed. So we, yeah, we do have some questions that are popping in here in the Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. And... Okay. What would we? Oh yes. Will you get recordings in the slides? Those will come up. Um, I think. Why don't we like jump right in there? And and what? Why don't you give us like one or two cases you've worked with? Like, give us give. Let's illustrate for our audience like how yeah would move in. I mean, a, a, so much of the research out there has really just been focused on the, what are the symptoms, but not really the trauma, the seed, what starts that all. Whether it's family yeah. symptoms, whether it's eating patterns, whether it's trauma. So yeah, here we go. You've got a case up here. Why don't we move through this and then we can open up some, some questions here. Yeah, this is just one person's experience. And but I'll say in general, um, that you know, what I've seen with different medicines, ketamine, seen it lots, uh, MDMA. Um, this has been reported by um some of the maps research looking at the subset of people who had uh like subthreshold and serious eating concerns, but an experience of a lived experience of being in one's body and being having like compassion and some positivity towards one's body, even if it's just during the medicine experience, um, has been profound. I remember as years ago when I first started working with ketamine at this eating disorder treatment center, there was uh, someone who had this kind of anorexia that just kept, uh, you know, they couldn't figure out how to get through it. It just kept, they had this, in this, you know, huge indifference towards treatment and recovery and didn't really have any desire for a connection with food or to get better and uh, didn't have hunger, fullness cues. And then like one dose of ketamine this is not, you know, what happens to everyone, but, but I've, I've seen it in different forms. One dose of ketamine, like coming back into their body from that experience, put them back into their, their hunger fullness cues or gave them a sense of, of uh, like a, a softened, a softened compassionate view of themselves. And that individual, um, they even like got a bit derailed. I bring it up um, because um, it was really interesting. It was so intense to be back in a feeling state and feeling hunger and fullness that they even asked like, could you give me a feeding tube for a week while I kind of like settle down from this uh, 
like reconnection with myself that was overwhelming. And then um, looking back on it even years later, you know, I've heard from them talking about how that was this real glimpse of what's possible. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I want to point out that it's not the the norm to have like one dosing experience um, leading to and a profound, predictable, lasting change, it really does create an opportunity and experience to be used in the path forward, um, whether it's, uh, you know, psilocybin, very different medicine, psilocybin, ketamine, MDMA, for example. Yeah. One of, uh, Michelle Brewer has a, uh, is one of our audience members, and she's asking us to mention uh, that we have a program coming out at Roots to Thrive as well in British Columbia on this that will be around using yeah. and and we've had a number um, and I'm sure you've had this too Reed that we've had a, a number of, of folks that have come through um our program and other people's programs that you know when you really get in in some cases of course everyone is different and these are different conditions with different genesis and different uh, symptom or symptomology um but for some of them it's it's really quite remarkable you know once they get connected to a community once they get connected to self and start moving through some of those resiliency tools, the psychedelics really land. They have a space to land yeah. as well, you know, for, I mean, in, in some cases, some of the, some of the um, conditions come about from disconnection as well. Yeah. Right? Really connect yeah. Them. These, these are diseases of disconnection in a way. Right. And, and I uh, love the rooster Fr thrive program, by the way, big, big fan from out here and and even signed up for uh, a group to go through it virtually with someone from out in BC who facilitated it and just loved it and, and you know, bought whatever books I could on it. So yeah, thanks for what you're doing. And, and it's good to hear from you, Michelle. Uh, I know Michelle from, uh, you know, past uh, interactions in this, in this world. So thanks for your comment. And Sue, Sue is also um, commenting on, on get, re, getting some research going locally in British Columbia. Sue, we're happy to c connect you with some teams out here so we can get that. Cheryl can help you with that. But what would you do? Read like it's money, no object. You can do the ideal psychedelic project, like psychedelic therapy within, um, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's always good to get the data out there and the science out there. But if it was a total patient oriented yeah. program. And and I understand there's different nuances with different conditions, but what, you know, if you had unlimited resources to serve a patient population in this using psychedelics, which, what would that look like and which psychedelics are you gravitating towards for that? Yeah, so uh, there have been some preliminary studies done and ongoing with psilocybin for anorexia and the lessons learned there are, I think, we may need more dosing sessions, we may need higher doses, and we may need a lot of therapy and to get really concrete about what therapies we're testing. And, and uh, you know, admitting all my biases and not knowing, you know, all these therapies, I just, I have some, uh, some training kind of personally in in recent years in emotion focused therapy, more recently in internal family systems. And, and I, I have worked with IFS paired with ketamine uh, quite a bit in groups and individual settings. I would love, and I've talked to Dick Schwartz about this at length, but he would love to see it too. I'd love to see like a, a really good a psilocybin plus IFS um, study done um, with uh, the right amount of time to do that, do that work. Um, but I, I also believe that... Uh, really any of these tried and tested psychotherapies for eating disorders um, paired with uh, the different psychedelics um, I think would be great to explore. And of course, the combination of things like what would it be like to do some MDMA plus therapy work? Some, I mean, like a lot robust and, and go into, you know, a classic psychedelic, um, you know, once you've kind of created more of a safety from within and then, what would it be like to then take someone and dissolve some ego structures a little more with the psychedelic, um, with the the right long road of prep, getting to that and and just more 
dietary interventions along with the, the study protocol and more um, kind of body and food related ones like uh, mindful intuitive eating, kind of embodiment practices. Uh, there's a researcher out of, of Canada um, in Ontario named Neva Piran, who's done great work on embodiment, wrote a book, um, a textbook on embodiment and the uh, experience of embodiment scale, EES, that I've given a lot with clients uh, and looked at a little bit with, with ketamine work. But that's been just fascinating to look at how is one doing now in these different domains of, of embodiment and what happens through the course of treatment, especially with psychedelics. An interesting question from one of our audience members uh, around microdosing. So some this this um, I'll just read it. I'm a 63 year old. I won't read it all, but you know was in inpatient treatment for 10 years ago in recovery for eight years. Um, older by 25 to 40 years than the therapist this person is working with, and now off home at home and using microdosing. I don't know what substance. Um, it could be microdosing psilocybin, LSD, ketamine. Um, yeah. But what do you what do you think of that? And it seems like so far so good, but also yeah, a lot of fear about the relapse. What have you come across anything in in your like clinical experience? Because I know there's no studies on it for. Yeah, for yeah, it's nice to see the some more um, microdosing research being done because you know I guess understandably and unfortunately it's been hard to think about doing those studies when microdosing involves taking this schedule one substance home and taking bits of it and traditionally done more in other countries. But, but if you could create the conditions for neurogenesis and things without um, putting someone in a full-blown psychedelic state regularly, great. And then the question is, what are you doing alongside that uh, to, um, and it's hard to tell in oneself on the microdosing level, hard to look at that with an N of one, but the nice thing about microdosing is the the safety uh, parameters seem to be um, pretty favorable, as, you know, but uh, I did hear from someone, this is just uh, like one little anecdote, but I found interesting that someone said they found a great deal of benefit from microdosing Ibogaine for their eating disorder. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of that before and I'm not recommending it by any means or don't have much to share, but but their point is, is there, it's a very interesting area to explore. And, uh, but I, I do think that, um, you know, and I think most would agree that the microdosing for eating disorders may be a tool and uh, an, another accelerate on the path, but, but, uh, but it's really got to be with a focus on the reshaping of the, the disrupting reshaping of the patterns and the rehabilitating of one's relationship with those things. Yeah. And one wonders with a really solid therapy team, really walking gently with someone, getting them ready to that ready state for that, having that big psychedelic spiritual experience, a transformation, and then following up, continuing that neuroplasticity on some sort of intermittent or schedule mm -hmm. for dosing and that might, might be. And I wonder if it's new receptors that have are more involved there with the ibogaine, but I had not heard that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting question. And, um, and, and even the, the dosing consideration of, uh, you know, what is best to have someone go into a big dose or are there, is there a stepwise approach that helps get someone ready to navigate and do the work? Um, I have kind of even mixed opinions and theories within myself of, of the big, like way showing pathfinding experience of a of a, a mystical experience in the psychedelic naive, but also that can be quite difficult and alarming and jarring. Um, and uh, in fact, I know someone asked about 5-MeO DMT yeah. for eating disorders and um, we're, we just started, I have a schedule one license for 5-MeO DMT here in Utah. And we're, we're just starting with Beckley. Beckley is a sponsor, a 5-MeO study, nasal spray, 5-MeO, two different doses versus placebo for treatment-resistant depression. Um, I would love to see that done for eating disorders. But, um, you know, as you can imagine, the, the sponsors of, of these studies and designers of the protocol are looking at um, 
like treatment resistant depression as maybe the initial one to focus on but but uh yeah i'm certainly curious of of what could be done with that medicine and other conditions um yeah well, and it really begs the question that if you have good clinics doing good work, like the, the double, like the placebo controlled double blind, these, these control trials are excellent and they definitely move the data forward. And if you've got a really good clinic that is doing yeah. therapy that you could, you can, we need more of these prospective observational studies, like here's Reed's clinic in Utah, and this is what they're doing. And now let's look at the outcomes and yeah. use to move the bar because these medicines are complex. People are yeah. complex. The, the challenges are complex and our studies are, are very reductionist, right? It's a pharmaceutical yeah. model mm-hmm. the reductionist of you can have one problem, one intervention, and, and then, but you don't do that in, in real life with mm-hmm. a patient. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I love real world studies and kind of, even though it is often retrospective in the way we do it, I love to like, like you're talking about, Pam, and like I've seen from coming out of the Roots to Thrive work, um, real world data that is actually done in the complex real world humans and environments that we cannot do. Like the study protocols and these sponsored like FDA fast track studies are so intensely protocolized um, by definition out of necessity that we just exclude so many people. They're so expensive and and uh, it's hard to get the big numbers. But I am... Uh, the compassionate use expanded access approaches you have available out there in Canada, um, you know, I'll admit I'm I'm jealous of and excited to work with Canadian colleagues on these um, to be able to leverage those um, outside of studies legally. And I know there are other ways and jurisdictions, but but yeah, I agree. More work of doing this in a good way and more sharing of that information with each other would go a long way. Right, yeah, and and there's an, a couple of few few more questions here. But you're in a you're in a place where the TDA exists, the 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 Divine Assembly. What do yeah. you think of churches being able, like in the U.S. You you like in Canada, we have some ayahuasca churches, and we have some uh, clearance for traditional use um, in some other medicines, but very strict. It's really really hard to get um, any of the other church exemptions. But the U.S. has been brilliant at mm-hmm. getting church there be a could there be a, a possibility for that for people to in the US to come together under a sacrament? To- yeah, I mean, there people are doing it in Utah. Colorado has been doing it for quite some time. Um, and I, I last night at one of our research clinics, we had an open house. Someone from the Divine Assembly Church who sits with psilocybin clients was there and really talked. I was asking, like, does do, does uh the state to the police, the regulatory governing powers that be come, come uh, knocking at your door often. And and uh, I said, so far, even a few years of existence, they're just, you know, recognizing that there are other um, problems, drug problems to go after and focus on. And they, they've just continued to be able to do this work. I, I don't know how to really kind of merge these questions and, and worlds uh, beyond just um, like all coming together in these forums and sharing ideas, but like a, a church isn't a clinic, a clinic isn't a church, but we have often very synergistic overlapping aims and intentions with helping people with these tools. So yeah, I looking forward to the design divine assembly meeting in January. I don't know if you'll be coming out for that, Pam, but uh but they'll be organizing a panel and maybe some things will come of that. Yeah, I think we're gonna have some interesting conversations around that. And and it's interesting too, like the part of the, the sacrament part, I think I find this really interesting is like, it's only in the last few hundred years where we've really removed our, any level of spirituality from mm-hmm. medicine, right? Yeah. And, and it really, you know, now we're in this sickness care model. And so you have to be unwell to get access. Whereas you know, if we had removed we these last few hundred years and we were still in our communities, we would be, you know, there would be rites of passage and, and maybe we'd have be having more access to whatever non-ordinary states were closer to home for yeah. each of us. 
There's a question here uh, from Jade. Thanks, Reed. Do you have any thoughts on the potential correlation of eating disorders and the influence of popular culture and psychedelics current influx in the relevancy in popular culture? Oh, thoughts on the correlation. Okay, and psychedelics current influx in, yeah, I would, I'm trying to uh, make sure I understand the question because it sounds really interesting, but um, Pam, do you have a, a sense for what what we're getting at here in the psychedelic? Well, no, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, it's I'm not sure if it's the in the indi um, how popular popular culture is influencing eating disorders, which you've you've covered. You've said like yes, uh -huh. it does. Um, and psychedelics current influx, like are we seeing the maybe it's uh, Jade? Are we seeing some clarification here? You might want to type some more. But are we seeing like that now? We're looking at psychedelics to help with eating disorders because both are in. I, I'm sorry. I, if I'm butchering that, Jade, let me know. Uh, one thing that I didn't have time to go over is uh, a paper that came out last year that you may have seen on preparing for the bursting of the hype bubble in psychedelics by Yaden and, and Roland Griffiths um, was a senior author on that and um, uses this Gartner cycle of hype to show that uh, that how, how uh, you know, things, the media has really blown up these things in ways that might be counterproductive if we're not careful. And we need to really ground everything we do in, in uh, an appreciation of both sides of the coin and, and all these perspectives and not ignore the risks that exist, but really keep um, keep studying, exploring in good ways, the potential benefits. And, and I do think there are a lot of far reaching um, ripple effects of the, the psychedelic uh, culture. And it's an interesting question to think of, if that was part of the question, how that relates to eating disorders. But I think as we as we wake up, as consciousness rises collectively and we're shining this light of awareness, more and more. That's one that, uh, you know, I, I already see people paying more attention to is their relationship with everything. Like, um, I know personally in my, um, you know, in the last decade of working with and, and exploring, um, however I can, these medicines, um, it's certainly given me this stance of like, why is this going into my body or my mind? Or what is my intention here? And just having more of a, a mindful awareness of things. And I, and I hope, you know, I hope we, we can just see that expand and spread. I'm trying to, is there any way to unmute Jade? So she can ask the question. Uh -huh. Um, I will put the... the there, I was just wondering if Reed had any thoughts about if there are any correlations, uh, any correlations with psychedelics and eating disorders and their involvement in media and pop culture. Um, so correlation with psychedelics and eating disorders. Yeah, I, it's a good question. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'd have to think about that, to be honest, but uh, yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, and I don't really have one to uh, share uh, off the top of my head, but, uh, but I, I do like getting stumped on questions. So thank you for that. Um, and I will, if it's okay with you, Pam, put the link to the slides in this chat. Is that all right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank right. you so much. I think we're going to have a lot more interesting questions about this coming up. And I think we should have another really, um, I don't know, I think I think there there needs to be a bit more of a conversation on this around psychedelics. Maybe we could bring some case studies next time. I'm yeah, really, yeah, that's a good, good point. Be, it'd be really interesting because, I, you know, there's so many different permutations and, and maybe we can really look at like, where are some success stories? Because I think you know, the food is hard because you can't live without it. It's not like other challenges yeah. in this world. And uh, if we can, if we can mm -hmm. really shine some light and some hope and some options and some directions where people can find support and find this, 
and get researchers together too. So if you're in Utah, get a hold yeah. of me. You know, look at this. Like this, these things need to be studied and in, in many, many uh, conventional and unconventional ways. I think so. There. Uh, oops, I put, I put in the chat. The slides went to hosts and panelists, but let me see if I can just put it to everyone. Hey, here they come. There we go. And uh, I'll put my email there just to wind down. Um, Great. And we'll, we'll add so all much, that to the show. Yeah. Add all that to the show notes. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you to the volunteers that make all this stuff happen. You guys are fantastic. And uh, until next time. Thanks for having me. It's been, it's always fun. Okay. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Wherever you are.